Hey, I'm Richie Castellano. A little while back, I did a video about my guitar collection, and in the comments, a few of you were asking for a bass collection video. So my bass collection isn't as extensive as my guitar collection, but I think I have some cool pieces, and it would be fun to share that with you. So today we'll do a bass collection video. Uh, before I start, I use picks on bass a lot of the time, and just in case you were wondering, I use a Dunlop Tortex .88 pick, and that's what this is. This is a 1975 Rickenbacker 4001. This is the first bass that I got that was my bass. Prior to having this bass, I just borrowed basses from my Uncle Phil. My Uncle Phil Castellano is a phenomenal bass player, and he taught me how to play bass. And he would give me a few lessons, a few pointers, and to practice them, he would loan me a bass. So I had this inexpensive D'Agostino bass, which was like some sort of import copy thing, and um, it had five strings on it, five string bass. So I actually learned on a five string. Uh, the one funny thing I remember about that bass is that it had a four string pickup on a five string bass. So the low B never really came through the amp, which was funny, but that's what I would practice on. So my father, my, actually my grandparents too at the time, both had music stores. And um, my dad knew I didn't have a real bass. I had basically a starter bass. So somebody sold this bass to him or he got it on a trade or something from the music store, and he knew I liked Rickenbackers. He knew I liked Chris Squire. He knew all about it. So he told me, he brought a case home one day, and I think I must have been 16 or 17, and he said, Richie, I, I got a bass for you that you're going to want to buy from me. And I said, I don't have money. Uh, I can't afford it. I don't need a bass. I got the bass I'm borrowing from Uncle Phil. And he says, uh, I think you're going to want this one. And I said, I don't think so, Dad. You know, I don't need a bass. You know, the bass I have is fine for what I do. And understand, if I had to play like a gig, like a wedding gig or something at that point, or a gig that needed uh, like a real bass sound, not that rinky-dink bass I had, uh, I would borrow a nicer bass from my uncle. So I really didn't have my own bass. Um, but my dad said, open the case. So I opened the case, and I saw this in there. And I said, oh, it's a Rickenbacker. Yeah, I know I like Rickenbacker, and I like yes, and and all that stuff in Rush and everything. And he goes, just play it. I said, Dad, I, I, don't, I, don't want this, I don't want this bass. He goes, just play it. I picked it up, I held it in my hand, I played it, and I said, how much you want for it? So, <laughs> because the reason I said that is because this bass is unlike any other Rickenbacker I've ever played. Uh, a lot of the Rickenbackers, especially the current ones, have this sort of like boxy, squarish shape on the neck that is, for a guy with small hands like me, is not very comfortable. This is a very, slim neck. It's very slim. It's almost like a guitar neck. So as a guitar player, it's an easy transition for me. Uh, it played great. It sounds unbelievable. If you want the Chris Squire sound or the Getty Lee sound, this will get it. I even have Roto sound strings on this right now, just for that extra bit of authenticity. So another cool feature about these basses is the uh, they have Rico sound. So there's two um, output jacks here. We have a standard uh, mono, which is both pickups to the one output like you would normally have on any other bass, and then Rico sound, which splits the neck and the uh, bridge pickup to different outputs so you can run them to different amps. And that's a big part of the Chris Squire sound. It's that like bi amp setup. So the only thing that's not stock on this bass, I believe, is uh, are the tuners. Uh, they're shallower tuners and they work fine, but everything else is, I think, pretty much original. I might have changed the bridge, I don't remember. But this has the uh, high gain pickup in the neck. So let's check it out. One of the coolest things to ever happen to me is when I got a call from Eric Bloom one morning asking me if I can fill in on bass for the weekend. Uh, so having this gig, I wanted to bring a bass that could cover a lot of ground, a lot of different types of sounds. So I couldn't bring the Rickenbacker with me. It was too 
Chris Squirey, I guess. So I asked my uncle again if I could borrow his bass. So he loaned me his gorgeous, very expensive King five-string bass. And there are probably pictures online of me playing that at my first few gigs. So after that first weekend, they asked me if I can do the next weekend, then the next weekend, then the next. And when it became apparent that I was going to be the bass player for a while, it was time to buy a real bass. Like, I'm not saying the Rickenbacker is not a real bass, but a bass that had more of a neutral sound that could do a lot of different things. So that NAM, it was 2004, or I believe that must have been 2005 NAM. Eric Bloom and I walked the entire NAM show floor looking for a five-string bass for a guy with small hands, and we couldn't really find one. But I ended up getting a Lakeland. And I loved the way the Lakeland sounded, but I just could not play it without getting severe hand cramps. So eventually what happened is, once again, my father got this bass in the store. And he said, Richie, I have a bass for you. And now I knew to trust him because he hit, the, you know, hit it on the head with the Rickenbacker. And I came in and here it was, a five string bass with a very comfortable neck, tight string spacing for a guy who's used to playing guitar, um, easy to get around this bass played great. The sound of it, not so much, and the look of it, I absolutely hated. The whole bass was this brown color. It looked like a turd, the entire bass. So I, uh, I said, that's not going to do. And the, the pickups that were in there were Bartolini's, but they were passive and they were, I don't know if they were passive, but they didn't sound great. So I asked my uncle, who aside from being a wonderful bass player, is also a guitar repairman extraordinaire. He can actually repair anything, I think. My, my uncle's amazing. But um, I said, I want to take this bass that I bought, this Ibanez, it's an SR505, and I think it's from 2005. And uh, I said, I want to take this bass and transform it into something that is a little bit more to what I'm looking for, a little funkier, a little louder. So he took me to the auto paint store and he said, okay, uh, what color do you want it? I said, I want the most obnoxious yellow you have. So we settled on this one, and I just love this color. It's so cool. This is just a perfect color. And uh, then I ordered from Bartolini. I ordered these, um, they call them the bright pickups. This is a pair of the bright pickups. I measured the cavity here, and you go on their website, and they have all the different shapes, and this fit perfectly. And I also ordered their active wiring harness, which is really cool. Uh, other things is once we were done painting, Anne-Marie, who we weren't even dating yet at the time, she, Emery is very artistic and she's a good painter. She painted the little BOC Kronos logo on the headstock because this was going to be my BOC bass. This was going to live on the road. So that's it. This is a really cool bass. I know a few other people who have gotten a SR505s and, and feel the same way that it's just a very comfortable, approachable five string. So let's play it. There's the bridge, here's the neck. And the way I would play it in Blue Oyster Cult is I would keep it in the middle and I'd play it with a pick. Occasionally, we'd have to do some slapping. Also, this is a um, bass, middle, treble, and you have a selectable mid-range frequency. It's very cool. Around the same time that I got the five string, my uncle found in a plastic bag in his workshop a Rickenbacker 4001 S bass, 1974, in pieces, completely stripped, gutted, and actually chopped in half. What happened was the previous owner tried to route out a space for a bigger pickup here, and he did so with just a drill, and he got so deep in the wood that the whole base cracked in half. So 
the base was just trash at that point, and I think uh, my uncle either bought it from him or the guy just left it there and never picked it up. Whatever the circumstance was, the base was done, garbage. And it had some hardware. All this was in a plastic bag. And my uncle told me, because you know, I found this base. We might be able to do this as a fun project. Another thing that happened is the previous NAM show, my uncle and I saw at the Rickenbacker booth, they had a yellow 4003 base. And when we came home from NAM, we tried to buy it. We said, we, we got to get this 4003 base in yellow. It looks so awesome. And then supposedly they denied that it ever existed. And we, sh we didn't take any pictures of it, so we had no proof. But uh, they denied that there was ever a yellow Rickenbacker base. So we decided, okay, we're going to make one. And we're going to take the, the scrap hunk of pieces and make it a yellow Rickenbacker base. Uh, when I saw this was a 4001S, now if you're not familiar with that, the 4001S is like sort of the no frills version of the 4001. It's got the dots instead of the triangles and it doesn't have binding. Uh, but it's actually, I think, the cooler base because it's the one that Chris Squire played and the one that Paul McCartney played. And as you guys probably know, if you watch this channel, I'm a big fan of both those guys, Paul McCartney and Chris Squire. So we began the process of rebuilding this thing. It was mostly my uncle. I helped. I did like, you know, sanding work. Uh, you know, I did whatever I could to uh, speed up the process, but he did the bulk of it. And what he had to do was he had to reconstitute this whole section of the base. Basically, he cut all this bad drilled wood out and he got new wood and glued it back together like a, you know, like a puzzle. And he put the whole thing back together. He put the neck on. I ordered some new electronics. There are some old electronics here. And I think this is the original bridge pickup. And I think this is the original bridge. And this is the original um, cover part for the outer part for the horseshoe pickup there. This is a brand new toaster pickup. I think this... I don't think this pickup was in there. I think I bought this new from Rick. It was pretty freaking expensive. And this is a new bridge. Uh, new knobs. My uh, guitar teacher, Mike DeCampo, gave me these knobs as a part of the uh, project, as his contribution. Uh, I think, yeah, I bought the new Rick tuners. And yeah, that's... And we rebuilt this thing. And then I had uh, the Luthier Leroy Aiello give it a once-over to help us make it a little more playable. And yeah, this is it. I decided to put, uh, I decided to put flat wounds on this because I wanted, I already had the, the, you know, the pangy, clangy sound from the black one for all the Getty Lee, Chris Squire type of sound. And for this one, I wanted to have the McCartney sound. So this is what it sounds like. <laughs> Out of all my bases, this is the one that gets used the most. This is a 2008 Ernie Ball Music Man Sterling. Um, I originally played one of these when a friend of my dad's brought it into the store and I tried it and I just loved it because I always liked the way the Stingray sounded. My uncle had a Stingray that I would borrow frequently. In fact, on my first album, Alone in My Basement, I think all of those tracks are done with my uncle's Stingray. And I just love that bass, but it was kind of hard to get around on for me because it was big. Uh, the Sterling is like a shrunken down version of a Stingray, which was very appealing to me. And also, this one has the single coil pickup for some different tonal variety. Not that the Music Man sound is bad, it's a great sound, but I also wanted to get some more conventional sounds out of this one bass. This was going to be my main recording bass, and it is amazing. I've never 
gotten this thing to sound bad. It's just, you, it's plug and play. It sounds awesome. It has a five-way selector switch. Just so you know, I always keep it in the second one, I guess, the second from the top, which on a Strat would be like uh, neck middle. That's where I keep it. That's the sweet spot for me. It has a three-band EQ. I usually just keep it flat. I'm gonna kick up a little bit of treble today, just so you can hear it. Um, the neck is ridiculously comfortable. It, it almost feels like one of my, you know, Axis necks. It's just that good. I just love the way that it feels. I replaced the uh, pick guard. It originally had a black pick guard. I put a clear pick guard because I took the pick guard off and I realized that there were no, there was no cavity under here. And this is beautiful. Like you really can see the finish with the pick guard. So that was the only mod I made to this. Uh, I am in love with this bass and every time I play it, I'm really happy I got it. Oh, the way I got it is pretty funny too. Um, my sister Nicole does some of the ordering for my dad's store. So we were at the NAMM show and she said, oh, I need to order another piece from Music Man. What should we order? And I said, order uh, a Sterling bass, kind of knowing that I was going to buy it. So I ordered this one for myself, for the store, but for myself. Uh, this is just a great sounding bass. <laughs> And I can do the uh, Music Man thing. Gonna quickly run through all the pickup combinations so you can hear them. Here is the switch all the way over here, which I think is just this. Here's the one I usually use, which is the second from the top. Here's in the middle. Here is the second from the bottom, which I think is just the humbucker split coil. And here's all the way at the bottom, which is the full humbucker. It should be obvious to you by now that I'm a huge Beatles nut. I love the Beatles. I always wanted the Hofner violin bass, but they were just too damn expensive. I couldn't justify spending that much money on a bass that I could play on no gigs unless they were Beatles gigs. But uh, luckily for me, Hofner came out with an import uh, inexpensive model and uh, my friends knew I wanted it. So Anne-Marie, my friends, chipped in for a birthday of mine and got me this bass. I think it, I don't know what the, the year is, the serial number's gone, but uh, I think it's late 2000s and this is just one of the most fun basses to play. I know it's not the authentic German one, but this it gets the sound. It just sounds awesome. I have no idea what these controls do. Uh, I have to keep them in one position or else it doesn't work. Uh, this is just a cool bass. I have Labella Beatle bass strings on here. I've used this on, uh, you know, on Beatles covers, but I also used it. We did a, uh, I did a Motown cover on, uh, on the channel. So I just love this bass, Hofner Icon B. It's a great way to own a Beatle bass if you can't afford one. <laughs> this incredibly funky looking bass is a bass version of the USS Defiant from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, 
which we all know is the best Star Trek series. Um, it was built by John Johnston, who is a Blue Oyster Cult and Band Geek fan, who also has his own workshop where he does CNC work, and uh, he made this amazing, very fun USS, USS Defiant bass for me. And um, not only does it sound cool, uh, and I'll play it for you. Not only does it sound cool, but also you can put on the nacelles. What? And there's a momentary switch for phasers. Sound not included. Isn't that freaking cool? So I want to thank John Johnston for this gift. It's very cool. <laughs> If you watched my guitar video, you know there was a point where I started getting into the classic guitar food groups because I got a Strat, a Tele, and a Les Paul. And I felt that part of that food group thing was to have a P bass. And I wanted a P bass very badly, but I never liked any of the ones I played in the stores. They were too big for me. I could not make them do anything. Uh, so one day, I'm hanging out in the dressing room at a Blue Oyster Cult show, and Danny Miranda is tinkering with this bass. He's setting it up, he's adjusting the action, the neck, and everything like that. And he hands it to me, he goes, hey, check this out. And I played it and I go, wow, this is amazing. This is a P bass, wow. This is better than any P bass I've played. And he said, you want it, it's for sale. And I'm like, yeah. So I, I bought it from him right, pretty much on the spot. Uh, and this, what it, this is like a Frankenstein bass. I believe this is a Mexican body uh, with an American P bass special neck. Uh, now the P bass special, from what I understand, is it's a little bit slimmer than a regular P bass, so that's probably why I liked it so much. He actually was gracious enough to give me two necks. He had two American necks, one with maple, one with rosewood, and I did a test. I'll put a link up here somewhere uh, so you could see what that test looked like. I did a, a neck swap and let people hear the difference, but I I ultimately decided on the maple because I just felt the maple played like felt better it was more comfortable to play and um the sonic differences weren't drastic enough where i you know there was one clear winner so this has a seymour duncan quarter pounder in it it also has the um the d tuner there the uh the hip shot the drop d which is really awesome i know i was thinking classic p bass when i bought this but this is a rock bass i mean you'll hear it <laughs> Sounds good with the pick too. If you roll the tone back, it'll give you that vintagey thing too. So that's it. Those are all my bases. Uh, I think I have, what is that, seven or eight? Uh, not too many, but I have a cool collection and I can cover all my bases. No, it's terrible. Forget I said that. I can cover a lot of ground with my base collection and uh, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you did, please give it a like. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to my channel. It helps me tremendously when you do that. Anyway, that's it for my base collection video. See you next time.